This screencast is going to look at modernist art in Russia itself, and as you can see from these two works by a pair of artists who work together, uh, Natalia Dacharova and her partner Mikhail Larionov, we can see in both of these that both Cubism on the one hand and Futurism on the other made a strong and immediate impact on modern art in Russia. Uh, this is because Russian collectors loved avant-garde art from other countries, uh, in particular from France, where they loved Picasso's work as well as Matisse, but also futurist works from Italy. And in fact, the futurist connection was so strong in Russian art already that uh, Marinetti came later in 1914 to deliver a lecture on futurism in Moscow to all of the Russian fans of the futurist movement. Gosharova and Larionov were working together at the Moscow Art School in 1909 when the two of them were actually kicked out of the school for being too radical uh, in 1909. And when they did, uh, they formed a group called the Jack of Diamonds uh, that same year to exhibit more avant-garde art in Russia. Uh, these group shows came to include famous international artists uh, such as the Russian expat uh, Kandinsky, as well as his friend Jelensky, whom we looked at and who were working in uh, in Germany as part of the Blue Rider group. They were also part of the Jack of Diamonds show in, in 1910. In 1913, in other words, four years later, uh, Larionov and Gontrarova begin a movement of their own, uh, branching away from uh, the rest of the group, and they called this movement um, Rayonism. They coined the term in 1913, and the word Rayonism refers to the fact that they're trying to paint not what they see, but the rays of light that move from what they see to their eyes. In other words, uh, not painting observed reality, but this sort of physics-based effect of how we perceive color. Um, they said we don't actually see the object with our eye, but we perceive instead uh, a sum of rays that reflect off the object. And uh, again, this is a direct quote from uh, their Rayonist Manifesto. Consequently, if we wish to paint literally what we see, then we must paint the rays that reflect from the object. So these are the rays of Rayonism. Uh, what we see here are those colors that come splashing off the object and into our eye rather than the object itself. This idea of focusing on color independent from the object might make a number of connections in your head, uh, particularly to the Orphist group uh, working in the suburbs of Paris, but also obviously to Futurism, uh, Giacomo Bala's painting of the traces of uh, the retinal bird as he looked through a telescope at the light of the sun. Another member of the uh, Jack of Diamonds group was Kazimir Malevich, uh, began showing with them at their initial show uh, and beyond, um, and again shows influence from the futurists. Uh, you can see uh, the human figure is mechanized, turned into a series of geometric forms, uh, the pails of milk pails being carried by the figure giving us the metaphor, not only for the figure itself, but for the other forms in the landscape. Uh, the human figure rendered almost like uh, it was made from metal, like a machine, is again a standard uh, futurist theme. It also seems quite similar to uh, works by Leger, who again is working in that Parisian suburb alongside the, uh, alongside the uh, Morphist, uh, his purest forms as well, have a direct connection to what we're seeing here. For Malevich, there may be more than just these artistic references to futurism and uh, purism. In fact, um, it seems altogether likely that this application of industrialized forms to peasant themes relates directly to uh, the ideas of Vladimir Lenin, who is calling for Russia to begin to modernize itself, uh, to begin to embrace um, modern developments of industry and whatnot in order to improve the situation for the rural working class 
Karen Malevich, uh, Lennon began to write these ideas in 1906. Karen Malevich in 1912 is, uh, it seems to be applying some of those ideas, industry applied to the peasant class. Now, as Rayanism went away from the Jack of Diamonds in one direction, um, Malevich goes in a different direction. He moves toward total abstraction. And he calls uh, this abstraction um, suprematism, the supremacy of pure feeling in art. He writes about the fact that he painted the black square as an attempt to free art from the burden of the object. And what he's trying to do instead is to simply paint pure feeling in art, not feeling raised by any given object, but feeling in and of itself. Um, here's a quote from Malevich. To the suprematist, the visual phenomena of the objective world are in themselves meaningless. The significant thing is the feeling as such, quite apart from the environment in which it is called force. Now, you may not see this as a form of expressionism, but this is exactly what Malevich thinks that it is, the supremacy of pure feeling in art. Uh, and I think in, if he's going to try to paint feeling itself, he has to not paint things that you can recognize, because at a certain point, a painting points to something else in the world around you, and not to the feelings that are... Uh, spawned by that thing that you're seeing. Uh, by divorcing the painting from anything in the world, the painting cannot point to something entirely different. And in this case, uh, the painting in Malevich's eyes uh, points toward uh, this pure feeling. His interest in abstraction may come from Russian traditions, in particular Russian icons which always had a certain abstract quality. They always gave you something against a plain background. So instead of here of St. Peter against a gold background, even St. Peter himself somewhat simplified, uh, abstracted in his own way, we have a different kind of modern icon, uh, the black square itself. And when he hung the black square, he would hang it in the upper corners of a room in, in its various uh, exhibitions. And, in fact, this is exactly where people in their households would hang, uh, hang their icons. So this seems to suggest that he did indeed see these as modern icons. In the wake of the Black Square, Malevich began to explore different possibilities of these suprematist compositions, these uh, evocations of pure feelings. Um, he multiplies the forms, he alters the colors, and he begins to make various juxtapositions of the uh, simplified forms that, on a certain level, begin to evoke space itself, as if these forms are floating. Um, in fact, he mentions in his writings that his paintings um, are intended to expre express the sensation of flight. Uh, the feeling of flying itself, um, another of these supreme feelings. This is interesting because obviously machine technology is, is part of that. Flight is a new uh, experience that's available because of the machine. And many people are linking technology to spirituality. When we think about this and look at his other uh, um, his other works, yeah, he often gives them interesting titles, things like magnetic attraction and wireless telegraph, uh, the airplane in flight. These are all symbols of the modern age um, and uh, are indelibly linked to the idea of, of technology itself. Other, other titles that he gives these works uh, reflect uh, the rural background of Russian art, the way in which it can, uh, that this all ties back to this somewhat backward, uh, unindustrialized Russia, and that these works are meant to help bring uh, the idea of industry to these works. Um, he 
saw these works as being profoundly realistic and new painterly realism. And the reason he says that is because these paintings really are more realistic in a way. The paintings don't try to illustrate something else. They are really only about themselves. Uh, they are about how paint is put on a canvas. That if a painting is, on one hand, nothing but paint on a canvas, then this is the purest form of painting. It's not trying to illustrate anything, uh, despite its title. Um, and they were always painted with the greatest of vigor. I think you can see here the brush strokes very clearly and how much uh, effort he invests in the line between the squares and the areas around it. Uh, again, if you're, if you're going to pare a painting down to be nothing but paint on a canvas, no illustration whatsoever, then you have to pay very, very close attention to, to how you apply that medium. And while he could have just painted this with a roller, he didn't. He, he works it up with brush strokes in every direction, um, even inside the square. When he exhibited these pictures, um, he called the exhibition um, 0 0.10, the last futurist exhibition of paintings, acknowledging that these ideas came out of futurism and have moved in a new direction. The title refers to the fact that there were 10 painters in the exhibition, and each of them was trying to find the zero degree of art, the core or essential minimum of art itself. All of these works are incredibly precisely painted. Um, again, because they are, the subject of the pictures is the paint itself in a way. Uh, how the painting is made is the subject of the painting, not what it illustrates itself. So if we look at these works, we can see that each of the bits, we're looking at detail from down here, is again incredibly meticulously painted with particular emphasis on the edges. I don't know if you can make this out or not, but there's also regulating lines through these. It's a small line that goes from the center point of the tank square here down to what's probably the balance point of those three pieces, almost as if it's hanging in space. And as we look at his works everywhere, we can see the degree to which he's really concerned with these edges and breaks, and how in this area here, uh, he's even come back and painted that little bit of white in a different tone uh, from the white on the background. And again, here I think you can see that line that I was talking about uh, that regulates the different things as they hang in space. But the focus everywhere is also on the application of paint. And you can see that every section of it is painted with the same sort of variance in brushwork that he might paint if he were painting something representational. Uh, the painting ends up being really very much about process. And that process maybe is the feeling that he's talking about. The feeling that is uh, brought out by painting is the feeling that one gets when one makes paintings. Well, finally, at the end of it all, he ends up coming up with the utmost supremacist composition, which is simply a white square on a white field. No sense of illusion, no sense of space and depth, not even any color. Um, and when he exhibited a whole series of these supremacist compositions in 1918, he wrote a manifesto about it. And he says that what he hopes that they'll do is, as, you, as the brushstrokes draw you in and invite you to look more closely at the work, um, he says you will, this is now a direct quote, uh, you will swim in the white free abyss. Infinity is before you. These are meant to be spiritual works to immerse you in something uh, wonderful, something beyond the surface. And it did come as no surprise that this painter too, uh, Kasimir Breitich, was also a practicing theosophist. Uh, just like Kandinsky, who we've seen before. Uh, what's really fascinating about these, I think, is that he's fully abandoning pictorial traditions 
one year after Russia staged a major revolution, the October Revolution of 1917. And it's not hard at all, I think, for us to link uh, this sense of artistic liberation to a sense of liberation in society and politics.